Vayilech Ishmi Beis Levi, Vayikach Es Bas Levi. Last week's reading. A person had gone from the Beis Levi and he married the Bas Levi. And Chazal tell us this was Amram who went to marry Yocheved, which was the mother of Moshe Rabbeinu. The Rashi cites over there, the Gemara in Soto, that initially he was married to her, but Amram, he divorced his wife or separated from her when the decree was given to kill all the males. Of course, he says, what's the point of procreating if they're going to kill the children? And then Miriam and Aaron were born. Miriam, his daughter, as a six-year-old, was already a prophetess. And she comes to her father and says, your decree is worse than the decree of Paro. Paro only decreed that the male should be killed. Your, your decree, because when Amram, being the leading Torah sage of the generation, separated from his wife, all, all men separated from their wives. There's no future. Therefore, in terms of what you've done, you've caused that there should be no Jewish children being born. And in addition, our mother will give birth to Moshe and Shal Yisrael, to the Redeemer of Israel. So the morale goes to ask, why does that when we speak about Amram remarrying Yocheved, it speaks to them about them anonymously? A person from the base Levi, Ishmi base Levi marries Bas Levi. Say Ve'yelech Amram Ve'ikaches Yocheved. Amram went and he married Yocheved. Why are they stated anonymously? That's the morale morale's question. So Moral answers that usually or always when a person has a child, two parents have a child, the child, what the child's physical and spiritual makeup has some relevance to the characteristics that the parents possess. And the child is the heir of those characteristics. Moshe Rabbeinu was in terms of his dimension of person, had no relevance neither to his father or to his mother. He was another dimension of neshama. It says in the Chazal, as we say earlier, that when Moshe was born, his mother saw that he was tov. He was born, he was tov. So Rashi says, what is tov? Tov means, nismale habayis kula ora. The house immediately became illuminated when he was born. The Shekhinah was with him immediately. Why was the Shekhinah with him? I mean, he... he he did nothing yet. He was just born. He was such a one of a kind of neshama. Therefore, the Shekhinah was with that neshama. And that's why later we find Moshe Rabbeinu's neshama, his soul, the dimension of his being, was the equivalent of all Klal Yisrael. That was Moshe Rabbeinu. So therefore, that one should not mistakenly think that what Moshe Rabbeinu was had anything to do with his parents. The Torah conceals the identity of the parentage here. A man went from the house of Levi, married Bas Levi. That's it. So why were they so special? Me, But they merited that the soul had to be born to existence. That it came through them because they, they were the most special people. Amr being the Torah, leading Torah sage of the generation. Being of the tribe of Levi, who was not tainted by idolatry because Levi was not part of the bondage. So a man from the house of Levi went and married the daughter of Levi, which was Yechevet. But the, the point of keeping it anonymous, because what Moshe was had no relevance to what his parents were. He was endowed, it was a divine endowment, because he had to be the redeemer of Israel, and therefore that soul was created by Hashem initially, at time of creation, that when it's time for the Jews to leave Egypt, he will be the one to come. That's, that's the morale. So now, Moshe Rabbeinu was in Egypt. He comes... And Hashem says to him, it were only posig vav. Lochain emor livnei Yisrael, ani Hashem. Tell the bnei Yisrael, ani Hashem. What does ani Hashem I mean? Until now, you may have perceived it as Dustin Avir had said. Since you've come, things have become worse. Ani Hashem. Yudke vavke is what? is the attribute of mercy. Meaning going forward at this moment, you're only going to see mercy. 
This is the beginning of the ten plagues. And therefore, Emor Levnesa Ani Hashem. And what is going to be a result of the Ani Hashem? You will be taken from under the sufferings of Egypt. You will be saved, you will be extricated from their service. And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm with great judgment. Meaning, with the plagues, the judgment is speaking, the judgment that can be brought upon the Egyptians. And I will take you as my people. And I will be your God. And you will know then that I am your God who took you out from under the sufferings of Egypt. Just let's do Rashi. Lochain. Alpi Osa Hashua. Because I had made an oath to, to the patriarchs. Emel Be Shani Hashem, Hanem Bahtachosi. Rashi explains the word Ani Hashem means, I am faithful to my promise. Votsiyas Eschem, Kikain Haftachtiv, because this is what I promised to Avram Avinu. It's interesting. Rashi cites the Midrash, and I will take you out with great wealth. What, is that, what does that do? It says, you'll be taken out of Egypt. Rashi says, no, in the name of Chazal. I promise you, you will have a great wealth. Now, and we had mentioned that the Jews became wealthy. There were three junctures we became very wealthy. The Makas Dam, when the plague of blood came, because the Egyptian, there was no water for a week. The only way the Egyptian was able to have water, he had to purchase it from the Jew. Because the water, the Jew's water did not turn to blood. And even if the Egyptian would take the water from the Jew, immediately it would ch change the blood. And the Midrash tells us that if the Jew was drinking out of the cup and the Egyptian would put a straw into the cup of the Jew, from they, that same cup, the Jew, Jew would draw water and the Egyptian would draw blood. The only way the water remained water, the Egyptian had to purchase it from the Jew. So therefore, just from the plague of Dam, of blood, the Jews became phenomenally wealthy. That was the first juncture. The second juncture was when we left. Hashem says that you should borrow from your neighbors, from those who you're in the, your household, the gold and silver vessels. And it says they actually, they took everything out of Egypt, which is tremendous wealth. But that was the personal wealth of the Egyptians. And then when the Egyptians, Paro and his chariot court and his armies, they pursued the Jews, the chariots were bedecked with gold and diamonds. And that's called Bizas Hayam. That was the spores of the sea. That when the sea had spit out the Egyptians with the chariots and they were on the seashore. It says the Bizas Hayam was Gedol and Bizas Mitzrayim. The spoils of the sea were greater than the spoils of Egypt. Now, so we discussed what was the point of the three levels, three times they become wealthy. We understand. That was the promise. And afterwards you will go out with great wealth. That was the promise to Avram Avinu. But first there was the wealth that the Egyptians purchased the water. Then there was the borrowing of the gold silver vessels. And then there was the spoils of the sea. Which was even greater than what they had taken out of Egypt. We'd ask the question. The Torah tells us that and initially Moshe, in Shmos, when Hashem had said to Moshe that the Jews before they leave, I will cause that the Jews will be seen with special value. They will find special favor in the eyes of the Egyptians. And then when they find special favor in the eyes of the Egyptians, they will borrow the gold and silver vessels, their personal effects. So we ask the question, why was that necessary? I mean, if nine of the 10 plagues already took place, and now we're about in the midst of the 10th plague, you go over to a person and you say, look, it's either your money or your life. You give over 
whatever it is, whatever is asked, because if you don't give it over, it's over. But yet, Hashem had to cause, bring about a miracle that the slaves of the Egyptians, they themselves had to see the Jews in that special light that they felt privileged to give over the most valuable possessions to the Jews, which is a miracle. Why was that necessary? That's the question we asked. So we, we'd explained was this, a person who has nothing, a person who's a beggar, and then afterwards, all of a sudden, he comes upon something that everybody wants, and he could demand any price he wants, and the people have no choice but to pay the price. So the person is no longer, in terms of, he's no longer destitute. He's able to have a large amount of money because he can ask for anything he wants because of the commodity he has. When the Jew had the water during the plague of blood, the Egyptian had no choice but to pay the price that the Jew asked for that water. So therefore, the Jews at this point are no longer destitute. They have wealth. But in terms of that wealth, how did that wealth come about? If the, the Egyptian had no choice but to pay. But in terms of their sense of self-worth as people, they were what? They were slaves. They were seen by the Egyptians as what? As chattels. They had no, they, their self-identity was we are slaves. We were able to put the Egyptians in position. They had no choice. They had to pay the price, which is the water. But what about that sense of self? We're slaves. What happened at the time when they borrowed this gold and silver vessels from the Egyptians? All of a sudden, Hashem causes that the Egyptian sees the Jew as something special, and the Egyptian is, feels privileged to give his most valuable personal possession to the Jew, his gold and silver vessel. What does that do to the Jew? The Jew all of a sudden feels, he says, you know, we never knew who we were. We're seen, we're esteemed and revered by the Egyptian. Now the, the master sees the slave as if, as if he's the master. So it's, that's already a sense of self. Hashem wanted that when they took the wealth, when they left Egypt, that that sense of self should be restored. We're not these lowly slaves, chattels of the Egyptians, but rather we're being treated as masters. And that's why Hashem brought about this miracle that there was a special chain, there was a special charm that the Jews were seen as special and the Egyptian, when he gave his wealth, he saw it as a privilege. I always give the example. Today, you know, we don't talk about Rockefeller anymore. We talk about Bill Gates, we talk about these characters. But at one time, you know, if, Rockef if a person goes over to another person and he says, you know, I'd like to borrow $1,000, person says, I'm not going to lend you the money. But he says, but I have collateral. I'm good for the money. He says, look, you want to borrow money? Go to a bank. I'm not a bank. That same person, Rockefeller, comes over to me and says, you know, Mr. Smith, I'd like to borrow $1,000. Could you lend it to me? He says, of course I'll lend it to you. So why to the first person, who the man was good and he could have collateralized it a thousand times over, he wouldn't give him the money? He says, go to a bank. But when Rockefeller asked him to borrow the money, he feels, of course I'll lend you the money. Because when Rockefeller borrows it, you know what it is? I lent Rockefeller a thousand dollars. So the person who's lending the money feels privileged that he could lend Rockefeller the money. The other person, he's an ordinary person. So what if you could guarantee the money? You want money, go to a bank, don't come to me. When the Egyptians gave them their personal effects, the golden vessels and silver vessels to the Jews, God caused they should be seen as what? As special. Therefore, the Egyptian, when he gave his gold and silver vessel, he felt privileged that he has the privilege to give his vessel to the special person. But what did it do to the Jew? The Jew was revered. He felt he's no longer, he's not a slave. The master is treating this, the, the slave as if he's the master. So when we say they left with glory, glory, not only did they not leave as fugitives, but they left their self-worth was restored as it was when they came to Egypt. They were treated as royal as royalty. The third, the spoils of the sea, what was its value? After the Chet Egel, what happened? I was saying that the spoils of the sea were greater than the spoils they took out of Egypt. If you take a look, the amount of wealth that was needed to build the Mishkan was enormous. The gold, the silver, and all the other materials, the 13 materials that were needed. 
And what, what, what was the value of the Mishka and what was the purpose? Because after the Chet Egel, we were disenfranchised. Hashem says, Vosli Mishkan Veshachanti Besocham. Make for me a Mishkan, a sanctuary I should dwell in your midst. To, to restore that original status. And these are the materials. Let's say the Jews would have hesitated. Say, you know, I think that it's a little too costly. There has been any degree of hesitation. God says, you know something, don't do me any favors. Here I'm, I want to restore our relationship and now you're hesitating because it's too costly. Hashem gave us wealth at the sea, which was so overwhelming that it outpaced the wealth we took out of Egypt that when Hashem asks us to build the Mishkan, it's like the Rufur Kodbul Makkah. God is, is preempting that problem by giving so much wealth that even that amount is considered a pittance. That immediately, the moment it's asked for, as it says, the day that it was asked, everything was born on that first day. So therefore, there wasn't a moment of hesitation. So each time we acquired this wealth, each one had its own value. The first time was to bring us from a level, level of destitution to a, a level of or people of means. Then it's to bring you, but you're a slave, to give yourself that self, the self-esteem, the self-value. You're not a slave, you're a master. And the third juncture, which was the smalls of the sea, which was this enormous wealth, which was even greater than the wealth he took out of Egypt, that was that there should not be any hesitation when the Hashem asked to build the Mishkan, the wealth was immediately given, and therefore God was able to dwell in our midst.